10, 9, ignition, ignition sequence start. All engines are level. Lift off. Lift off. Roger, the clock is operating. And as we say goodbye to the Boys Club, it's time now for KerbalCast, Episode 39, Equal Opportunity Kerbal. First sample ready for scan. Sending data back to you now. Are you reading? And in our Command Module Pilot seat, that's CMP. Nostromo. I am your LMP, Lunar Module Pilot, Biff Aldrin. And coming up in today's program, meet Valentina Kerman. KSP gets its very first female Kerbal Knot. Giving North Star a heart attack and bewildering Mitten Poe, it's our progress in the game. And this week's mission briefing, it's the latest letters, tweets, and also Kerbal news, and... The Jeb has landed! It's the latest episode of A Kerbal Life by Amy Kettlewell. Okay, I have a question. Yeah. The little soundbite that we just played, uh -huh. you do realize that was in your honor. Yeah, I, yeah. I do appreciate that. Where was that from? Europa reported. Right. It took me a while to figure that one out. Yeah. <laughs> What uh, since since Kerbal and we'll talk about this more in detail uh, in a minute, but uh, Kerbal has its very first female Kerbal knot. Yeah, and her name is Valentina Kerman, which is based on the first woman in space who was Soviet. And so I wanted the sound of a Russian astronaut. Yeah, Russian, which is astronaut. weirdly specific. <laughs> okay, you gotta search that one out. Yeah. Um, it, just to tell you how bad the, the very first thing that I could the only thing I was trying to think okay I need I need the sound of a of a Russian woman from a movie yeah the only thing I can think of right at first was are you ready Xenia on a top from Goldeneye oh I was about to say is it a Bond movie but yeah and Austin Powers Ivana Hump a lot yeah <laughs> and I'm thinking okay both of those are like really bad examples yeah those kind of just take back the whole yeah. purpose of what we're talking about today. right and also when I listened there were one of two things at all times either there was music going under it to the point where what they were saying was hard to pull out yeah or what they were saying was so wildly inappropriate oh, okay yeah so what I finally did was um I have one of our listeners, uh, his his uh, username is Haywood Floyd, okay, mm -hmm. uh, from 2010 and also 2001 A Space Odyssey. Yeah. And uh, he and I were chatting while I was trying to find all this, and I had typed into Google Russian women in movies. Well, actually, I typed in Russian women, and I got a lot of dating sites. <laughs> yeah, and, some pretty good deals going on. <laughs> yeah, and, you know, for a minute, what I actually, I considered briefly, because uh, they have these uh, Russian tutorial, these videos for, you know, like, you know, how to date Russian women. Yeah. And so, and I was saying, oh, this would be good, because, you know, they, there's this there's this Russian woman, and she's talking. The problem is, is there's like this very white romantic music playing under oh, it. Oh, yeah. You know, and it was, you know, <laughs> how how to ask a Russian women about her partners. And it's like, OK, we're not doing this one. Yeah. So anyway, so I typed into Google. I said Russian women in movies and it pulled up a list on IMDb. Oh, first thing that was on the list was um, 2010 A Space Odyssey. And I almost used that. Yeah. You have been drinking your whiskey from Kentucky. But I figured that's, A, that's hard to understand. Mm -hmm. You've been drinking your whiskey from Kentucky. Yeah. And B, it still doesn't relate. Yeah. Okay, but 2010 was like the first movie on the list. And I scrolled down and I saw Europa Report and that's where I got it. Ah, there you go. But I was trying to find this, and I had mentioned to Haywood Floyd that, that I was doing this, and about this time he goes, hey, check this out, and he sends me a link to the exact same IMDb page. Oh. <laughs> yeah, and it was like, I'm on that page. Yeah. We are literally on the same page. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly right. We are literally on the same page. So anyway. Yeah, IMDb's got a list for pretty much everything. Yeah, I never I never thought that they would have a list for Russian women in movies. Yeah. But, I mean, seriously, it's there. Yeah. It, I mean, you know, I mean, somebody put that together. Yeah, and so. there it was. <laughs> but, yeah, so anyway, so that's where, and that's where I went, oh, that's right. Katya from Europa Report. I mean, that movie just keeps on giving. Yeah, yeah. And it's actually, I've uh, af after pulling that soundbite out, 
I went back and I'm rewatching. I'm about halfway through it again. So oh, okay. I'm readjusting my opinion. Yeah. I'm. I'm. It's. It. It gets. It's better on a second viewing for me. Oh, good. I'm. Good. I'm enjoying it more the second time. Yeah, because the first time you had a hard time going in with the whole documentary style kind of stuff. Yeah, the whole found footage. Yeah. I. I think. I think part of that is when we when we were talking about it when we did our review and I can't even remember what episode it was but it was several back. Oh yeah. When we were doing our review of that, um, the whole found footage genre was still going full bore. Well, that's kind of fallen by the wayside now. Yeah, I don't remember the last found footage movie that's come out. Yeah, like, it was probably some Western. Yeah. <laughs> about, <laughs> some like medieval movie with yeah. found footage. They found like a wooden VCR. Yeah. It's a, it's a, because back whenever we were talking about it, like the next found footage movie was just around the corner. Right. You know, from the one that just finished. Yeah. Like it, it had a big surge there for a second. Yeah. And I think uh, things like uh, Cloverfield really gave it like a big yeah. boost for those just coming out constantly. But see, now that found footage has kind of fallen by the wayside. Yeah. Uh, you know, and I'll admit, you know, uh, I mean, you know, a lot of times with movies, sometimes if you don't like them the first time, it's you drag your own biases into it. Mm hmm. So anyway, well, I know that you have had some progress in the game because I saw you when I, I was on Steam and it popped up and it yeah. said Nostromo is playing Kerbal Space Program. <laughs> it's a miracle. It's a miracle. And I thought, I thought, you know what? In the past, when I see you playing, I always go, you know, like, hey, I want to watch. Yeah, yeah. It's like I thought, I'm going to leave the poor guy alone. <laughs> it turns out <laughs> I've been sitting on the title screen for like days. Just, <laughs> just like, oh, yeah, I'm playing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And just, and just to make sure the definition is correct, you're munching on a sandwich. Too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's a sandwich time, man. Is so, it sandwich time if you're actually sitting there, not doing anything, but eating a sandwich? Yeah. Because okay. you're, you're spending time with your sandwich. It's important to spend time with, with yeah. your sandwich. Yeah. Well, you don't want to you know? neglect your sandwich. You don't want to neglect You don't want to just ignore the sandwich. And... Your sandwich is an important part of your life. Yeah. It's your sandwich. Yeah. Anyway. Um, Everybody's looking for so, that special so, sandwich. To go with the title on Bewildering Vitinfo, <laughs> I, I played two times this week. And one of them, it was like, I was going to go to the game shop in like an hour or two. Mm -hmm. You know, and like just play some board games up there. And I was like, oh, okay, I'll kill some time with some Kerbal, you know, like, I'll try to see what I can get done, see if I can complete a few contracts, get some money going. I get on there, and Mitten Poe's like, hey, can I watch? And I'm like, yeah, this going to sure, get Sure, why not? <laughs> Let's see how this goes. And uh, and he's watching. And so last time I talked about building a rocket car mm. to uh, complete the contracts that were on the, like, all the ones where I had to get EVAs on the ground, because I had to get a lot of little EVAs. We have a letter about that, by the way. Oh, yeah. About the rocket, rocket car. So, um... I was building this thing and it started off meaning well, you mm -hmm. know, it was like, it, I basically built it like a, like a dual pontoon boat, right? you know, like there's a center part and then there were two, like, it was just kind of split in half or into two tubes mm -hmm. and that's what the wheels are. So it had a larger surface area, so right. it was like less likely to flip. And I got it going the first time I had a little, uh, wings on it on the top to, mm -hmm. to steer it. And, uh, and I was like, I wonder how the brakes work. And I hit the brakes while I was going to like, they're like just emergency brakes. They're not just like you ease on the brake. Oh, really? Like, yeah. And so like, whap. Yeah. And so I hit the brake, the thing flipped <laughs> over and it blew up. I was like, okay, let's go again. So I built it again and I get going. It's and, Kerbal Ball Run here. And, uh, and I was hitting, I, I did exactly what we talked about last time. What? I was hitting shift tab to, so I could talk to Mitten Poe. Oh, okay. And I kept throttling up. And so whenever I got back, I was going fast. I was like, ah! And then like I flip, flip over a hill and it'd blow up. And I was like, oh, man, he's really wondering how I ended up doing a podcast about this. <laughs> and so I, I try again and I start driving. And he's like, this is going to take forever. Are you sure you don't want to fly? And I was like, I don't know how to fly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, don't, I don't know how to land. I, I know how to fly. I don't yeah. know how to land. Maybe if I build something with so many wheels, it's so wide, it just can't help but land. <laughs> a part of it will make it. Maybe that's what I need to do. Oh, I have a feeling the game's going to put that to the test. <laughs> yeah, so I, I was I was cruising around with that. And then and then I saw that he got on the game. So I was, mm -hmm. I was willing to bet. He was like, I can't take this anymore. I got I to gotta, I gotta see something right done in this game. But that that was the first time, my first play session. Mm -hmm. Oh, and then I don't know if he was there for it, but I had the like most haphazard but successful um, Mun orbit I'd ever done. <laughs> <laughs> 
I was. You've just described a lot of Kerbal gameplay right there. <laughs> Haphazard, but surprisingly I was like, successful. I was like, all right, I'm about to leave. You know, I have all my stuff packed up. I'm about to go. I'm going to try to make um, just a slingshot around the Mun and get some Mun science real quick. Mm -hmm. I just want to see if I could do it. Right. So I, I build the rocket, and it had been so long since I tried to go to the Mun because mm -hmm. I've been spent so long in, like, you know, contract purgatory that I haven't been able to go and do anything else. So I launch, you know, and I have, like, my command pod and everything. I didn't send a probe because probes are just awful right now. Right. Like, in career mode, you don't get SAS. Mm -hmm. Like, you need an SAS module to do it. So Oh, really? Yeah, so in the beginning, probes just, they're not good. Well, it's yeah, it's like yeah. wrestling a wild animal. Yeah, yeah, and I'll, I'll get to that in a second. So, uh, <laughs> oh, <laughs> ooh, yeah. So, now I'm intrigued. <laughs> I launch this thing and I get it, and um, I'd been so long since I can build maneuver nodes now and stuff. So mm -hmm. I built maneuver node, but it'd been so long since I'd done any of this. So like, it was like twenty thousand, um, twenty thousand meters. Whenever I remembered, oh, wait, I need to start tilting my orbit whenever mm -hmm. I was in the air. Right. <laughs> so I started tilting. And then, um, you know, I get up there to uh, to the uh, maneuver node, and I'm like, okay, I need to burn, like, half of it until I get, like, just near the end and burn mm -hmm. the other half. Mm -hmm. And I kind of forgot about that, and I burnt all of it. So my orbit was way different than <laughs> how it was supposed to look. And then this thing, I you know, I do, like, one orbit, like, one uh, huge um like oval or mm -hmm. like oval orbit around yeah, around a, yeah and and I do like one or two of those and then I catch a mun encounter I get that and I'm at so little fuel it's it's insane it's just yeah. so bad right but I I get around it I do I do my science or whatever and it completes part of the mun contract which was nice and then I slingshot back but I have like just barely enough fuel so I hit that little bit of fuel and it got me um some air braking Mm -hmm. And then I air braked my way down. But the entire time I was like, oops, well, let's try this. Oops. Oh, let's try this. Oops. Oh, hey, it worked. I totally meant to do all that. Like, <laughs> I then made it back down as I got some decent science. The second time I played, I um, tried to complete some contracts and stuff and got, got a couple of them done. And then I built, I was like, I'm going to send a probe just around, around the mun, mm -hmm. you know? And so I launched the probe and I realized it didn't have SAS. So I'm wrestling this thing the entire time. Like, like just trying to keep on a maneuver node. Like I'm just like constantly like, right, with right. all the keys, you know, just trying to keep it centered. Is that what your keyboard sounds like? Uh, it's not a machine keyboard, but I hit the buttons really hard. Okay. So, <laughs> and so, um, <laughs> I'm flying, I'm flying around and eventually I get an orbit made, but right. I don't really have any science modules on it. Like I have a, I have a thermometer just because, uh -huh. but you know, I can't take a any, thermometer just because, just because I can't take any, <laughs> <laughs> I can't take any, th uh, temperature readings while I'm brought space. to you by the thermometer association. So I just took one. Um, I took one whenever I was just, you know, I hadn't taken any thermometer readings on uh, Kerbin. Mm -hmm. So I did one before I left and then I launched the thing. And I can't do any in space, so it's kind of useless right now. I don't really have anything on it, but I got the orbit uh, part of the contract done. Okay. So all that's left is transmitting, is landing and transmitting science from uh, the surface. Okay. So, yeah, that, that was kind of a progress. So Mittenpo, you happened to tune in like during what was pretty like much the worst part. Yeah, which is kind of like rolly time. You know, like any <laughs> any time I decide to build something stupid just to see just see how it goes. You yeah. happened to tune in for that. Yeah. <laughs> so maybe better that than watching the worst like. The worst attempt I ever had, like that, actually ended up succeeding of going near the mun. Well, some you know sometimes I've, I've mentioned in the past that uh, that I, I enjoy watching Twitch TV sometimes. Yeah, and you know you'll see somebody uh, will have a stream going on Kerbal, and you'll click in, and you know, and it's an hour of them building a rocket, mm -hmm. and you know that really puts the endurance, your 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 tolerance to the test. Yeah, because you know after a while it's just. Uh, He's putting another strut on. Yeah. It's like, oh, do you want four of those or you want three of those? <laughs> yeah. So, <laughs> you know, uh, it's like, I want to I want to see, like, you know, death-defying daredevil stuff. Yeah. So uh, my, my channel, my, like, uh, tuning into what I'm doing can be pretty entertaining at times. Yeah. <laughs> Especially whenever I get, like, frustrated. I'm like, I'm just going to build something dumb. Mm -hmm. And I like, mm -hmm. keep build something dumb and just keep reverting and just doing whatever. 
I, you know, I, I've never had this experience before, um, but now that Steam has it where you can watch other people play, mm -hmm. um, when, I, when I play, you know, a lot of times people will, will tune in and watch. And I'll have chat windows going and things like that. And that's, it's fun. Yeah. yeah I have to say, fun. it's a lot of fun. Yeah. And also, you know, you get these unexpected moments of hilarity. Mm -hmm. um, I did, I told you that with, uh, now that I've put Deadly Reentry and FAR as part of the game. Yeah. Um, the the now known, now known as the Kettlewell mode. Um, I, you know, I, um, I've been working my way back out and I went to Duna. And I had actually two people were watching me and, um, you know, Duna has its own atmosphere. And so the, the lander that I took had parachutes on it, mm -hmm. but it doesn't have an atmosphere like Eve does. So I underestimated, uh, how effective, or I should say I overestimated how effective the parachutes would be. Yeah. So here I am barreling down at the surface. Right. And I'm thinking, no problem, because I'm going to pop my parachutes yeah, pop and it's going to slow me down. And so I'm just barreling down and barreling down and I fire off the chutes and I'm still just barreling down and I'm going, um, oops. <laughs> you know, so I hit the Z key in full throttle. Yeah. Just plow right into the dune service. Just this huge explosion. And the people that were watching me who had been absolutely silent up to this point, one of them pops up and he goes, total F9, dude. <laughs> <laughs> How many people have you had watch you at once? Uh, I've two, two, two. Usually okay. it's one. Yeah. Same here. Yeah. But, uh, and that, that gets me into, uh, our part of our, uh, uh, coming up in today's program. You remember I said giving North star a heart attack. Yeah. Yeah. Well, all right. Lay it on me. Mine's over. I have always suspected that if somebody who really, truly knew what they were doing, ever watched me <laughs> they would have a heart attack yeah i now have firm evidence that this is true <laughs> you know and the listeners know uh north star is an extremely intelligent individual he i mean he understands this stuff on the subatomic level right and i was doing a mission this was, I already had, uh, you remember I talked about the train concept where you put like basically yeah, an engine yeah. in space and then you put mm -hmm. fuel cars. Like, like old cars. Yeah. yeah. Well, I already had the engine part in space and now I was sending up um, a, a fuel car. Uh -huh. And what I do to get the engine in space, generally I use most of the fuel in it. So the first thing I have to do is I have to send up a, a tanker to refuel the engine. And then I start sending up the fuel cars mm -hmm. to go with it, right? Well, I started up the game and I got this request, North Star would like to watch. Yeah. And what I was doing was I was sending up a tanker, okay? And um, I, when I'm playing the game, okay, I get tunnel vision. I don't always see, like when people are chatting and things, I don't always see what they're saying, especially if I'm really focused on what I'm doing. So I launch, right? And Northstar is saying things to me and I'm not seeing it. Okay? Cuz I'm cuz I'm, you know, I'm I'm launching my tanker and I'm getting yeah. it up and yeah, over focused on like it pops up at the top left, but yeah. like you're you're kind of just focusing on what you're doing. Yeah, it's like I don't even see it. Yeah. But I get up into orbit and I see the very first one that he that he sends to me and he basically says, you know, um, you know, he's saying, you know, hey, listen, it's you know, uh, at the angle you're at, basically, it's going to take you a long time. Yeah. Um, and, you know, and, and the, your target is, you know, way ahead of you. And, and I was like, and I wrote him back and I said, I'm, I'm still establishing my orbit. You know, I haven't, I haven't set up what I'm going to do yet. Yeah. And then I went back to what I was doing. Okay. And then uh, after a little while, I see another thing come up from him and he's basically going, you know, wow, that's a really big rocket you've got there. You know, why is it so big? And I'm, well, it's a tanker. It's meant to be big because it's carrying a lot of fuel. And then I go through the whole rendezvous thing uh -huh. and, and the two connect and I see up at the top, it says North Star. Wow. That's impressive, Biff. And I was like, oh, well, gee, thanks. <laughs> and then he says, and he says, you know, okay, you know, your engine stage is really big. Why is that so big? And I said, well, you know, I use that to go to like Duna and, and whatever, blah, blah, blah. And so I transfer all my fuel and everything and I get done and I'm thinking, I'm going to, I'm going to go ahead and exit out of the game and I'm going to say to North Star, 
hey, listen, I would really like to watch you play because I know that, you know, you really know the game and I would like to watch you and pick up some pointers. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I exit out of the game and that's when the chat window comes up. And that's when I see that I got maybe one out of every five chat messages. Oh. <laughs> and so I start scrolling. Yeah. And I realize, oh my God. <laughs> this is, I wrote these down. Yeah. Um, when I launched, Northstar said, you should really be pitching over more sharply earlier. Staying at 45 degrees like that makes for a very inefficient ascent. Uh, I got into orbit. Uh, Northstar said, oh, this is going to take a long time to phase into position. You might as well time warp. Followed by, you've got to get the craft in the lower orbit ahead of the one in the higher orbit. Followed by, this is, all caps, by far, <laughs> one of the biggest rockets I've ever seen. And that's where I said, well, it's a tanker, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Uh, followed by, you're trying to phase with an elliptical orbit? This is going to take forever. <laughs> so now I begin my rendezvous. And understand that I'm not seeing any of this. Yeah, yeah. Okay. This is, this is what he writes. He says, well, this is a different way of doing rendezvous. <laughs> Fairly slow and rather inefficient, like your rocket ascent, but it works. Yeah. Uh, might be more similar to the way NASA does it, though. They do tend to be fairly cautious when doing rendezvous. And then my favorite. Jeez, Biff, just turn up the time warp. <laughs> Uh, then we get, so why did you send up this monstrosity of a tanker anyway? Uh, and this is still during the rendezvous, yeah, okay? Yeah, yeah. Um, Quote, uh, Biff, if you don't turn retrograde, this is not going to end well. <laughs> um, after I get them docked, I get all caps. My goodness, Biff. <laughs> if that's the fuel module and engine section for an interplanetary transfer vehicle, do you realize how much extra mass you're carrying? <laughs> oh, he called you fat. Yeah. And then he said, it's very Kerbal in a way, though. <laughs> It turns out that, yeah. you remember I said, after I docked, he said, wow, that's impressive. Uh -huh. Do you know what he was saying? <laughs> he was looking at my time in the game, yeah. my hour count. Oh. He wasn't saying my rendezvous was impressive. He wasn't, he, he <laughs> was actually just pulling his hair out watching the rendezvous, like, why are you doing it this way? <laughs> no, what he was looking at was he goes, wow, you've got like, you know, almost 1200 hours in the game yeah that's impressive and that's all i saw was that's impressive <laughs> like oh thank you yeah what i didn't realize was it was like he was just but the whole time watching me he was just going no what what are you doing <laughs> why are you doing it that way um and then he was already gone yeah when i exited out and i was gonna go hey you know let's get let's get together and i want to watch you play mm -hmm. he was already gone he had already said well i you know i gotta go do this other game see ya and yeah. he was gone and i was like but 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 he's playing uh sid meyer's civilization i think yeah he was playing beyond earth oh okay, okay. Yeah, and he's doing it um he's doing it i'm not sure how he's doing it but he's doing it by email oh they're doing it like by turns by email so like they email him a turn and he does their turn or something? I guess. I'm, okay. I'm not sure how that works. Yeah, no, I've never, I've never done that. But anyway, he says he's doing a turn-based by email Civ, yeah. fi or, well, Civ Beyond Earth. I mean, I know people who've done like Dungeons and Dragons games like that. Yeah. You know, like where they just do it by email or I'm not sure post. how you would do that by email, but that's that's he says that's how he's doing it. Well, that's so. pretty cool. Anyway. Yeah. But I now have absolute proof <laughs> that somebody who really knows what they're doing, yeah. if they ever watched me, <laughs> would, would have a heart mind. attack. <laughs> and these are honestly, these are only a few of what he wrote. Yeah. Most of it was just this long just stream of no, no, no. <laughs> um, but uh, but anyway, but he, it was but he was right. You know, for example, he was talking about um, about pitching over earlier, sooner. Uh, earlier and sooner same word yay yeah. um but so i immediately went back and and did an ascent the way he was talking about it. and he's right it is more efficient so like how's it different well it's it's what he was saying because do you remember 
a long time ago, yeah. somebody had asked us, how do you do the ascent? And, and you and we, I both said, we go straight up into space, and then we her. pitch over to 90 degrees, and we you know, we do our orbit. Yeah, and it was... <laughs> and that unleashed a torrent of letters going, you fools! Uh, yeah. Right. Um, so since then, I've been doing what, what had been said to us, which was uh, I go up to about 5,000. Um, and that's when I pitch over to about 45 degrees. And from there, I wait until I get my apoapsis um, anywhere above 70. Yeah. Okay. Um, once I get above, and then I kill the engines and I ride to the top of the apoapsis. And that's when I circularize my orbit. Yeah. And typically, I'll go up to about 120 because that's when you can, uh, once you get up there, that's when you can really engage your time warp. Mm -hmm. Um, but that's how I've been doing it. Um, that's, that's the way, that's kind of the way the listeners had recommended. Um, initially they were saying go up to about, uh, 10,000 and start your pitch over. But some other people had said, you can actually start it at five. You just have to be much more careful. Yeah. Um, and also now that I'm doing far, um, I'm having to be a lot more cautious about my throttle because wind resistance gets to be a real issue now mm -hmm. um you know you if you start i've i've noticed I'm, i've been watching my thrust to weight ratio with kerbal engineer um if you get uh anything over it seems this is not a hard fast rule but my experience has been if i start going more than two thrust to weight ratio in other words two times mm -hmm. um that's when i start running into trouble yeah that's when i start getting you know flames you know, re-entry flames, except on the way up. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's when I start getting a lot of wind resistance. Uh, so I've kind of, you know, you have to really nurse that throttle up a lot more. Um, and also, uh, the other thing is, is that, you know, depending on, on how balanced your craft is, uh, when you start to pitch over, if you're not careful, it will continue to pitch over even when you don't want it to. Mm -hmm. And pretty soon you're pointing straight at the ground. Yeah. Which, you know, is kind of a problem uh -huh. when you're trying to go in the opposite direction. But anyway, but yeah, what he was saying basically was, um, and, and I understand now, I'm, I'm going off of the one thing that he wrote. So I'm not trying to put words in his mouth. I don't know if I'm accurately doing it the way he was saying. But what I do is, is based on what he said, um, once I'm clear of the launch pad, uh, I pitch over just a little bit. Mm -hmm. And then by the time I get, as, as I go up, I steadily increase my, my angle, my, my tilt angle. And by the time I actually do, I mean, I'm, I'm almost at mm, 75, 80 degrees, um, before I'm even out of the atmosphere. Yeah. And so what happens is by the time I reach my apoapsis, um, I've almost completely circularized my orbit anyway. Uh, I still haven't, I mean, you know, I still have a, a negative periapsis, but I'm using the same amount of fuel, but by the time I get to the top of my apoapsis, I've almost completed my orbit already, whereas before, I would use the same amount of fuel to get to the top of my apoapsis and then have to circularize the orbit, mm -hmm. i.e. burn up a lot more fuel. Yeah. So he's right, pitch over more sharply uh, earlier and you know and and kind of carefully write it up so and i'm still experimenting with it because yeah. i i've done it you know i did it one time and it was just i mean it was bulletproof efficient mm -hmm. and then i did it the next time and it was like you know most of the trip was flames were coming off the you know the tip of the of the ship and yeah you know and it was like my my ascent was you know it took me forever i had almost completely dry tanks by the time i got to 70 on the apple apsis mm -hmm. and it was like okay well this is obviously not efficient so yeah. but anyway so you had a question um you at what altitude did you start pitching over um i almost right off the uh, almost right off the launch but and when i say that i mean just barely yeah i mean okay. just barely okay um, I, I have tried to pitch over almost from the very beginning. And if you pitch over too much, that's when you find yourself pointed at the ground. Mm -hmm. okay. um, again, my experience, um, as I've said repeatedly, I'm, I'm not the most expert player. You know, I'm still learning. 
Mm-hmm. Um, and, um, you know, I'm, I'm obviously a better player now than I was when we started the podcast. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the listenership has a lot to do with that. And me too. But, um, but not me, I'm, I've become a better player since I started. Yeah. Not, not yeah, but you. you started with the podcast. So, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I, you know, um, I, there's varying degrees of, you know, obviously everybody who plays this game has a different level of experience. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I've had, um, I've had people watch me when I'm doing a rendezvous and they don't know how to rendezvous. And so they watch me do it and they go, Oh, okay. Now I get it. Yeah. Um, whereas North is watching me do a rendezvous and he's going, you know, why are you doing it that way? There's a much more efficient way to do it. Mm -hmm. Well, obviously he is so far ahead of me in terms of experience. So, you know, it's, that's the nice thing about being able to watch each other on steam is, you know, you never know what experience level you're going to get. Yeah. And, um, and you know, like for example, with North store, North store watched me. And I mean, you know, I was laughing at the fact that, that, you know, that the chat window was just him having this sustained heart attack. Uh-huh. But the fact is, is a lot of what he was talking about, I was able to go back and apply and, and actually learn something out of it. Um, and, you know, and I, I mean, I played it for comedy, but I actually learned something. Yeah. Out of yeah. It. Um, and then I've had people watch me and, and they've learned something from it. Um, rendezvous is one of those things that, that, you know, I'm rendezvousing the way that I figured it out. Mm -hmm. Um, and as I go on, I suspect my rendezvous style will change over time as it gets more efficient. Yeah. What I'm doing right now is what I figured out. And you remember I've said in the past, part of the difficulty of teaching rendezvous is there's a certain amount of feel involved. You know, you have to have, you know, there's, there's kind of a you know, you feel your way through it to some extent. Mm-hmm. Um, that's kind of where I'm at. I have a feeling that if Northstar were to teach you how to rendezvous, he could sit down and explain to you exactly a very efficient and a very specific step-by-step way of doing it. Yeah. Whereas I tend to do it more by feel, you know, it's more of, okay, I'm here. My target is there. Therefore, I kind of sense that I need to do this and mm-hmm. then and then whatever. Yeah. Um, and, and as he put it, he, you know, he said he said this is my style is more like how NASA does it. Apparently, mm-hmm. um, he says, you know, they tend to be more cautious. So I'm at least at NASA level rendezvous. <laughs> at least. At least. So oh, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm OK. I just do so, the same way NASA does. I'll, I'll give myself at least that much credit. Yeah. But my progress so far, uh, let's see, I gave North Star a heart attack. Uh-huh. Um, I have been to Duna uh, and back. Oh, good. Um, also, uh, I, did, um, I did a mission where I went from Kerbin to the Mun, landed, came back, rendezvoused, went from the Mun to Minmus, landed, came back, rendezvoused, and then back to Kerbin. Mm-hmm. So I did a I did a complete tour of the Kerbin system, Kerbin and its two moons, in with one ship and one lander. Yeah. So and that was kind of fun. I've never done a you know I usually go straight to the Mun and back or straight to Minmus and back. Uh, I've never done you know Mun Minmus and back. Mm-hmm. But that that brought up a question I was curious about. Uh, obviously Earth you know we have one moon. Yeah. The moon. Hmm. Um, I wonder in the future, like, for example, let's say someday when we're living on Mars, I mean, Mars has more than one moon. Yeah. I wonder, um, would, if we ever went from like Mars to one of the moons and then one of the other moons, Mm -hmm. would we be worried about cross contamination? Because I I thought I mean I know this is I know it's Kerbal and I know it's a game but yeah. I thought to myself okay the same lander that touched down on the Mun now touched down on Minmus oh okay okay like which means I've got like Mun dirt yeah on my landing pads yeah and I'm touching down on Minmus I have thought I could think of that you know because I know that when the you know I know that when the moon missions the Apollo moon missions when they came back they immediately quarantined everybody mm-hmm. 
and they and you know they they sealed up the moon rocks and everything um you know it just it just makes me wonder in the future would we ever i mean would we worry about things yeah, like would, that yeah it would be like oh you know we can't we can't hop from moon to moon yeah, know. it almost makes me wonder. It'd be like, would they carry a second lander? Would they have like, a, you know, like completely different spacesuits that yeah. they, you know, that they had to wear? Yeah, they hose it off or something yeah. before they head over. Or I mean, you know, or I don't know. Maybe I maybe maybe by then the attitude would be, well, it's all dirt, so who cares? Yeah. Although that would, you know, that would that would throw future geologists crazy. Like, how's it? Yeah. You know, because like centuries later they'd be on minmus going but we've got mun dirt here yeah. how, how did that happen <laughs> did they ever bump into each other at some point or something <laughs> there'd be the unified mun minmus theory yeah so anyway well that was my um that was my thing uh, the other thing i want to give a shout out by the way uh i said that i went to duna and back mm -hmm. i discovered you know how uh during the closing credits we always thank the subreddit kerbal academy and kerbal space center or yeah yeah kerbal, kerbal space program um kerbal academy uh on the right side of the screen has several links mm -hmm. and one of them is the transfer calculator and i had never used oh. that before uh you know i told you i do a lot of this by feel a lot of this is just simply self-taught yeah well i was cruising through the kerbal academy subreddit and i noticed that that long list of links on the side and i clicked on transfer and and it was already set to kerbin to duna transfer and i thought well that's what i'm about to do yeah that's that's convenient so i clicked on it and it showed me exactly the angle that the two position the two planets need to be in to make an efficient transfer and then it shows you the angle that you need to eject that you need to leave kerbin from hmm and so using that just kind of as a as you know just kind of eyeballing the angles from the calculator i was able to make a i mean i mean just literally a straight shot yeah from curb to duna that's cool yeah yeah i would one you know today you know you, you use a lot of times you use analog clock face as as a way of of explaining angles mm -hmm. now that everything's digital how do you explain that to anybody? <laughs> um, uh, what slice of the pizza it is? Yeah, well, that's true. Like when you that's open true. the box, is it the top slice? Yeah. Or is it, you know, like a quarter of the way through? Well, to use the analog clock face, yeah. uh, if you want to make a Kerbin to Duna transfer, according to the transfer calculator on Kerbal Academy, yeah. the subreddit, uh, Duna at three o'clock, okay? Pizza slice three. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I can't wait till you explain where Kerbin is. <laughs> Kerbin at about 5.30. Now, what slice would that be? Uh, that is slice... Uh, that wouldn't, that'd be in the middle of, the, what, the sixth slice? Uh, if Well, actually, there's like... It's usually cut into eight pieces. Okay. So 5.30 would be slice four <laughs> and a half. <laughs> a really thin slice. Well, no, it's not... No, you'd be into your fourth slice, yeah. halfway into your fourth slice. What's that? What's that joke? Do you want me to cut the pizza into four slices? No, cut it into eight. I'm not that hungry. Oh yeah. <laughs> but, but anyways, yeah. So anyway, but yeah, it's really cool. the The transfer calculator. I'm giving a shout out because it really did make, you know, that it's it's about what I would estimate on my own. Yeah. But it was nice to be able to calculate it and and actually see it and yeah. and, and it's also like a confirmation, like yeah, like it affirms that you were uh right in your assumptions mm -hmm. yeah and also the other thing that helped me was i i'm real good at transferring from an inner body to an outer body mm -hmm. i have difficult i still haven't developed the 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 feel to transfer from an uh, from an outer body outer body to an inner body yeah easily mm -hmm. so when it was time to leave duna and go back to Kerbin, i went back to the transfer calculator and it showed me exactly how to do it yeah and i was like oh okay okay because i'm just you know i'm so used to going out you know going from like curb to duna or mm -hmm. curb to jewel to me that that makes so much sense because you know you want to be behind you know obviously it's the same orbital principle with rendezvous you 
you know, if 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 the planet that you're on and the planet that you want to go to is further out, you know, you want the planet that you're on to be further back yeah. and lower. Well, that makes sense. But then if you want, if you're on an outer planet and you want to go to an inner planet, then it's like, oh, um, it's the same principle, but it's kind of reversed. Mm -hmm. And your exit angle is different as well. Whereas um, Kerbin to Duna, you exit in the direction of the orbit. Duna to Kerbin, you exit in the direction contrary, you counter orbit. Yeah. Counter orbital. Is that a word? Counter orbital. Yeah. Uh, the other thing I'm and I'm I'm going to put a link to this, uh, and this is something else I got off of Kerbal Academy. So I'm they're getting all kinds of shout outs. Yeah. Uh, somebody posted a delta v chart, and it shows how much delta v you need to get from the surface of any planet to uh, to a uh, to like a hundred kilometer orbit. And uh, for Eve, it's like I think they said it's like twelve thousand delta v. And I have managed to build. Oh, look at you! You're drawing a you're drawing a pizza. <laughs> I'm figuring this out. I'm going to make this work. You're going to try and figure it out. Yeah. But um, for Eve, I th if I remember correctly, they said that it takes twelve thousand delta V to get from the surface to a uh, I want to say a hundred kilometer orbit. And I have managed to build a ship, a lander that has like nine thousand delta V, but I can't for some reason get that last. 3,000, but I'm still working on it. But anyway, so I'm going to put a link to that up. But uh, definitely, there's a lot of really cool links on uh, on Kerbal Academy and the front page. Well, um, that does it for our progress, so we're going to go ahead and uh, move on, okay? Yeah. Okay, very good. And now your letters and the latest news in the mission briefing. Well, guess what, folks? Kerbal is no longer a boys club. Uh, we have a news article, and Nas is going to read the article itself. Uh, this comes from PCGamesN.com. Yeah. And the title of it is Kerbal Space Program Soon to Train Lady Astronauts. Take it away, Nas. In a giant leap for Kerbal kind, Kerbal Space Program is opening its doors and airlocks to Kerbals with a different set of chromosomes. Yes, Kerbal Space Program is getting its very first female scientist, Valentina Kerman. Revealed on the Kerbal Space Program blog, Valentina was shown off taking a break from what looks like some kind of pod shuttle. She looks pretty friendly, doesn't she? I bet you all can't wait to send her into space on one of your inevitable disasters of a mission. Just a first look is all we have for now. Hopefully news of when Valentina will appear in-game will break atmosphere very soon. The um, This appeared on the Kerbal Space Program website. Uh, it looks like they have finalized the artwork for what Valentina is going to look like. Um, the Based on the tweets, I thought she was going to get added to the game by now, but yeah. so far I haven't seen her. Mm. Um, I think she is, I think the plan is still, she's going to be part of 1.0. Yeah, I could see that. So, but the reason that her name is Valentina Kerman, um, this is a little bit of space history. The very first woman in space, uh, her name is Valentina Vladimirovna Tereshkova, still alive. Oh, wow. She will be on March the 16th. Yeah. Mar I'm sorry, March the 6th. She will be 78 years old. Oh, awesome. Um, I went to Wikipedia and uh, very quickly, her biography... Uh, Valentina Tereshkova is a retired Soviet cosmonaut and engineer and the first woman to have flown in space, having been selected for more than 400 applicants and five finalists to pilot Vostok 6 on June the 16th, 1963. In order to join the cosmonaut corps, Tereshkova was only honorarily inducted into the Soviet Air Force and thus, she also became the first civilian to fly in space. After the flight of Yuri Gagarin in 1961, Sergei Korolyov, the Soviet, the chief Soviet rocket engineer, came up with the idea of putting a woman in space. On February the 16th, 1962, Valentina Tereshkova was selected to join the female cosmonaut corps. Before her recruitment as a cosmonaut, Tereshkova was a textile factory assembly worker and an amateur skydiver, which was important because, are you ready for the qualifications? They had to be parachutists, under 30 years of age, under 5 feet 7 inches tall, 
and under 154 pounds in weight. Uh -huh. The the Apollo the uh, American I'm none of those things. The American space program had similar similar requirements. Uh, you know, obviously you had to um, be qualified, mm -hmm. but you also had to fit certain size requirements. Yeah, it's like the Air Force for if like all these people are like, oh yeah, I saw Top Gun, I want to go yeah. fly jets. Yeah. And so like, well, actually, yeah. if you're too tall or if you weigh yeah, too much. Yeah, you're six foot five. Yeah, it's like you can't. We're not jamming yeah. you in that little cockpit <laughs> yeah. there. Well, I told you when I saw um, Liberty Bell in a museum after they pulled it off the floor, or the mm -hmm. ocean floor, the Gus Grissoms, I mean, there was like maybe an inch or two from his arms and the top of his head and everything else to, yeah. the, to the to the side of the capsule. Oh yeah. So yeah, I mean they they jammed you in there. There wasn't there wasn't much space to you know like scratch your nose or anything. Um, although Tereshkova experienced nausea and physical discomfort for much of the flight, she orbited the Earth 48 times and spent almost three days in space. With a single flight, she logged more flight time than the combined times of all American astronauts who had flown before that date. After dissolution of the first group of female cosmonauts in 1969, she became a prominent member of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union, holding various political offices. She remained politically active following the collapse of the Soviet Union and is still referred to as a heroine in post-Soviet Russia. Russia. Are you ready? Yeah. In 2013, she offered to go on a one-way trip to Mars if the opportunity arose. <laughs> At the opening ceremony of the 2014 Winter Olympics, she was a flag carrier of the Olympic flag. Isn't that amazing? Yeah, that's so cool. Do you know what I think? I think Squad, when they do roll out 1.0, mm -hmm. they should. she should be part of it. Yeah, that'd be, that'd be pretty cool. Can you imagine that phone call? Yeah. And be like, <laughs> hi, uh, yeah, there's these little green things. And we named one after you. And and we put them in space, and we named one after you. Yeah. Could could you come here? Because we're going we're gonna to announce an update for a video game. Yeah. And she'd be like, this is a joke, right? <laughs> you guys are kidding. No, seriously, but wouldn't that be cool if, if she was part of the 1.0 rollout? She is, she is still very active. Um, she is, I mean, you know, yeah. at age... I guess what would she have been 76 at that point yeah she was like yeah send me to mars might as well might as well <laughs> anyway so that's a little history uh the first woman uh first female kerbal knot uh in the game is named after the first woman in orbit and i think that's cool yeah that's really cool. i think that's that's a nice little nod to history well let's get to our letters uh and you have got the first one this one's from misha first of all Brisbane oh, yeah. is not pronounced Brisbane, let alone Brisbrain. Although you may have started something there, had a good chuckle since one of our politicians was trying to turn Queensland into the smart state at some point. Anyway, the correct pronunciation is Brisbane, yeah, or Brisbane. as locals would say, Brissy or Brisvegas. Okay, here's my question. Yes. Bris Vegas? It has nothing to do with foreskins, right? <laughs> Uh, I don't. I, I'm not going in there. Because so, you know, if you think about it, you know the slogan for Las Vegas is "What happens in Vegas stays in Vegas." Yeah. Okay. If you had your bris in Vegas, uh huh. Technically, what happened would stay there, right? Uh, I mean, because you wouldn't want to take that with you, right? I I don't want to take this any further. Yeah, I know that. <laughs> I, I don't. I don't blame you. Secondly, that's an awesome idea of having some contracts being interesting milestones or achievements. Although the question would be, if they were not posted as contracts, how would the player even know that they could be achieved? The early altitude ones are trivial, but how would the player discover later achievements? Still, a great idea to explore. Regarding and, and whose idea was that? It was mine. It was yours. It was mine. Regarding the 1.0 release, initially I was totally on the no way it's not ready bandwagon. There's so much that needs polishing in the existing content, quite apart from the several major new features being introduced, that I couldn't imagine the 1.0 release to be anywhere near what a finished game should be. That was with the assumption that uh, Squad is releasing updates as always. I've always been with KSP since uh, 0.23.5, so not really all that long, but 0.24 came quite quickly and 0.25 wasn't that far behind. 0.90 took a bit longer, and I think that may already mark the change of their development model. Isn't that... You and I started at uh, 23.5, didn't we? I think it was 23. It may have been 22. Because I, I know we talked about 
point two four and yeah. point two five. Yeah. Whenever they introduced point two four and so, just all the different stuff. So that, that's about where we were. Yeah, we were in it for a little while when we started the podcast. I mean you were in before that. Yeah. Yeah. I, I can't remember I don't point, remember how long I think sixteen. Yeah, something like that. Yeah. And that's when the lightning bolt struck me. <laughs> Biff. <laughs> You must do a podcast. Yeah. If you podcast it, some will listen. <laughs> <laughs> Although they may not be happy about it. So in standard development, you traditionally have a couple of cycles. Development, alpha, beta, release, maintenance. And during development, you're churning quickly, adding, removing features and bugs. And basically, it's very, very unstable. Not really suitable for early access, but more on that later. Alpha would be when you've locked down most of the major features, you're adding minor features and you're starting to focus on bug fixes and so on. Beta would be when you've locked down pretty much the entire spec, your feature complete and you're just tweaking, bug hunting, optimizing, balancing, etc. Release should be pretty much the last beta version with no changes apart from upping the version number and tagging it as such. That is, the last beta build is the first release. After release, you traditionally enter maintenance code, which includes some additional bug fixing, balancing, and maybe even some new minor features or changes which the client has requested since release. Often these days, you, and especially for early access, it's somewhat different. For EA, you basically you start off in alpha. That is, every build is functional. Uh, EA for early access, not electronic arts. Uh, not feature complete, okay. not 100% stable, but pretty good and certainly usable. But from one build to the next, you still add major and or minor features, as well as fixing bugs, etc. Mainly concentrating on scope completion, though. However, beta and release should still be the same as above. That is basically a series of bug fixing and optimizing steps. Now, the other major difference between traditional software development and early access is that the former, the public, doesn't get access until it's done. Duh. Duh. Again, these days the lines are blurred, and or at least it feels like it is whenever you get the latest game, which requires a day zero patch and various further tweaks in the months that follow. But traditionally, release is pretty much 100% uh, complete, optimized, and bug-free, with no further changes or patches expected. Or at least it should be. Doesn't, don't you always get that sinking feeling when you when you get a brand new game on day one? Yeah, and it's like, hey, you, we're patching. Like, and you pop it in, and it's like, like you spend the next hour watching patch after patch after yeah, patch. Like, oh, it. here it comes. You go, oh, no. <laughs> Finally, my position changes this. Squad has changed the development mode of KSP from early access to traditional. Instead of turning out new versions of KSP, as soon as some feature is mostly complete, they're not only implementing a feature, but also largely polishing it and adding it to the game is mostly complete. They have also built up a larger internal test and QA team, so my guess is that it will take quite a while for 1.0 to be released, and when it is, it will be more akin to a traditional game release. That is pretty much 100% complete, bug-free and ready to roll, rather than an early access release where rough edges can be expected. AFTW BBL, acronyms for the win, be back later, Misha. For the win. Be back later. I should add, by the way, um, in last week's podcast, uh, I had been sick the week before. And so yeah. we were doing two weeks worth of letters. Um, sometimes I do not understand why this happens, but sometimes Google will group together um, emails, even if they're not from the same person, okay. they'll start to bunch together. Mm -hmm. And a couple of them got bunched in with some others. And when I was going through this week and getting everything ready, it was like, oh, you know, Misha had sent like a letter a week ago mm -hmm. and I didn't see it because it got bunched in. Oh, was it that one? And so what you just read was I took, he wrote two letters and I took them both and I combined them into one. So oh, okay. that was a two for one. Yeah. This was, the next letter is another one that fell through the cracks. Uh, and this came from our good friend, Run Phil Run. Uh, and he said, uh, Biff and Nos, I found a mod today called Part Wizard. I've only used it a bit, but so far it has saved me some headaches when I accidentally offset a part inside a fuel tank or I was messing with a complex station. I felt this mod deserved a shout out. Uh, again, it's called Part Wizard. Um, also, I got a kick out of the pledge perks you put on your Patreon site. <laughs> Do you think we'll see any more in the future? What, let's see. Our perks are, what is it? <laughs> I, I thought I had to make those, so I just made some. Well, it wasn't what, one, it'll make you suffer through it. Yeah, a, if you pick any, like, seven, if you donate, like, a certain amount of money and you send, you pick a, like, a 
YouTube video of anything, I'll watch it yeah. and then I'll talk about it. Well, didn't you, and didn't you also, um, didn't you also, um, what did you say? You said it had to be under a certain length. Yeah. I was like, I was like, give it seven minutes or seven minutes of yeah. a long video or something. If you want to make NOS suffer, <laughs> if it's worth, I think, wasn't it 25 bucks? Yeah. Yeah. We'll, we'll put some cheap, funny ones on yeah. there. I think also didn't I'm trying to remember didn't we also say if you want us to mention a YouTube something 25 Yeah it was like, like it was that. like 15 or 25 and we'll mention your YouTube channel and uh, as long as it isn't like your like you know yeah. strip tease channel or something right. we'll we'll mention it Well I think didn't I say in the last one or or previous I said like 50 bucks in Biff War pants <laughs> Please give us please, 50 bucks please we please. need 50 bucks uh, let's see. Okay, continuing. This is the letter from Run Phil Run about deadly reentry. I installed it at about the same time as you, Biff, and some experimenting has taught me to reenter at a shallow angle and spend as much time in the atmosphere as possible to make the most of the air's drag forces. Yeah, he's. Um, you remember I talked about this before. I've discovered now with deadly reentry, don't come straight down. Yeah. You want to come in at a shallow angle. Mm -hmm. um, for some reason, that seems to that it the the heat shield seems to like that best. Yeah, I guess I think it's because, uh, boy, I'm 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 literally just pulling this out of the air. I think it's because when you come in at a shallow angle, I think that optimizes how you're using your heat shield. Mm -hmm. Because I mean, you are you're literally flat with the I mean, the heat shield is literally flat. Yeah, with with the angle that you're coming in, mm -hmm. or I should say, with the direction you're coming in. Uh, I have found that with near installed, angling. I see. I don't have near installed. I've got far. Uh, angling the command pod on descent can actually act as a wing-like surface and glide you along. I found this out when uh, it took longer than I expected to reach the ground, and then noticed that my altitude was climbing again. I might have been skipping between the two lower levels of the atmosphere, but interesting nonetheless. I haven't had much success using parachutes, however. Whether or not they deploy is at the mercy of the Kraken. I have a question for you and other listeners using deadly reentry and near or far. When is the minimum pressure setting in the parachute context menu, and how do I set up my chutes to work well on reentry? Thanks. Great show as always, and fly safe. Um, that's a question the listeners are going to have to answer. Cause I, <laughs> I, I was under the impression that that wasn't something that you, I thought that was determined by the game. Yeah. Do you, do you actually set that yourself for a deadly hand? I think you're asking the wrong person. No, I'm saying for the shoots. Cause you know, if you oh. right click on a shoot, um, it'll, it has a, a couple of, I don't, I didn't realize those were adjustable. I'm, Hey, I'm learning as we go. I mean, I know you can cut them and you can try to repack them. Well, but it, but it shows you what the um at, at what i guess you can uh, now that i think about it i guess you can adjust those um it yeah. shows at what altitude and what what um uh, atmospheric pressure your shoots will pop yeah will pop um mm. so let's see what was his question uh what is the main what is the minimum pressure setting in the parachutes context menu and how do i set up my shoots to work well on reentry i've just been using the default setting yeah which is like 500 meters above surface so yeah. pop yeah so until now, I was unaware that that was something you can adjust. Yeah, that, if if it is impossible, for, if it is possibly something you can adjust. Yeah, for delivery entry, that'd be something nice. Yeah. Hey, listeners, <laughs> we uh, if you have any information on this or if you have any recommendations, please let us know. Uh, is there an optimal setting for the parachutes? Um, one other thing, I was talking about Northstar earlier, and I meant to mention this, but I, I jumped right over it. Uh, Run Phil Run recommends a mod called Part Wizard. Uh, Northstar said that there's a mod called procedural parts that allows you to like custom make parts. Like you can custom make fuel tanks and things like that. Yeah. And he says it really helps you with your frame rate. Uh, and the, eh, we got tag flapping. <laughs> um, dogs in the background again. Um, he said that what it is, 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 you know, a lot of times when you're building a ship of a certain size, you put different pieces together to yeah. create it. What he was saying is rather than stacking fuel tanks to get a certain size, uh, procedural parts, if I understood him correctly, um, allows you to actually create a tank that size. Oh, okay. It allows you to actually create the pieces, the size you need. Yeah. And that way, when the game is rendering your, your ship, 
it's only rendering a few parts as opposed to, you know, it's rendering one tank instead of, say, four tanks. Mm -hmm. and, but you're getting the same capacity and the same size. Yeah. So anyway, uh, two mods uh, that are being recommended, Part Wizard from Run, Fill, Run, and Procedural Parts from North Star. And I believe you have the next letter. Yeah, this is from Josh with Explosions. I don't have the mental capacity to imagine how you two look, oh. but I've tried to imagine what you guys do for a living. Nos, at first I thought you were a security guard in an office building. Uh, I, I don't think I really look intimidating enough to, to pull that one off. Then, for some odd reason, I thought you were a clown. And I don't mean a circus clown. I thought you were one of those clowns that go to birthday parties and make balloon animals. You, you know, would I, be like, I can't imagine, I you as I, a clown. I think I found my calling. <laughs> yeah. You'd be like, ah, shut up, you <laughs> stupid kids. But I've recently come to the conclusion that you are a construction worker. Uh, Biff, I think you're retired. Not retarded, retired. <laughs> Josh with explosions. Uh, I will say that is that is very close. Um, it's not exactly that, but I do work around those people. Mm -hmm. um, it's I think clowns, be, birthday it, clowns, uh, and construction workers. Okay. So um, that's that's you'd have to get extremely specific to find anything closer than that. Um, I pretty wow. much work at construction sites, um, just doing like minor uh, like speaker systems and stuff. You know so, what? I think he's onto something. What? Is he telling me my true callings to be a clown? I you know next time I'm gonna get some some long balloons. Uh huh. And I'm gonna see what I'm gonna I'm gonna see if you can make a balloon. Animal. I can I can do some decent shadow puppets. You know what? So, I, I bet it's like genetic. I bet yeah. genetically, like, like if I just, gave you a long balloon, you yeah. could immediately go. <laughs> Look, <laughs> it's a poodle. Yeah. So <laughs> I don't know. We'll we'll have to try it because that'll sound awesome on the podcast. Yeah. Yeah. No, I'm, and to answer your question, I am not retired. Um, <laughs> if I were retired, the length of this podcast uh, would triple. Yeah. Like I would, I would leave to go off and do something and it would go on for like three yeah. or four more hours. Well, we'd have to have a completely separate segment called Biff's Progress. Yeah. Because <laughs> you'd be playing like three times as much. And you know, and the listeners, there would be like, there would, we would encourage gambling because people would be going, okay. I I bet twenty five dollars that Nos will fall asleep within the first ten minutes. Yeah, <laughs> and I'll be doing my progress, and people will be listening, and in the background when they just start to hear, it's like I won, I won. Yeah, because yeah, my progress when I when I'm retired, my I mean literally my progress report would be like, okay, Monday morning I got up and I started the game. And then I would recount like the first six hours. Yeah. And then I had lunch. And then the next six hours, then I went to bed. Tuesday morning, I got up. And the whole time you'd be. Uh. Actually, you know what? You know what we could do? We could, we could basically just say, you know, okay, uh, Nas is going to leave now. Yeah. <laughs> and he's going to come back in a couple hours when I'm done with my progress. Yeah, maybe in a week or so, two. Yeah. So no, I'm not retired. Because if I were retired, there'd be a lot more Kerbal playing. Yeah. So anyway, uh, let's right. see. Oh, I have the next letter, yep. don't I? Okay. Uh, this is from Stevie. Uh, hi, Biff and Nas. Uh, what, you know what I think is going to encourage gambling? People are, are going to count the number of time dogs' tags start flapping. Oh, yeah. The dog tag count. Yeah. I need to... Uh, <laughs> I, I need to I need to do that. Oh, it'll be a drinking game. Oh, there you go. It'll be a drinking game. Take it. <laughs> take a drink every time you hear tags flap. <laughs> That'll be good. My girlfriend is the one who uh, who who's she she was giving me the you know the uh, the the um the the chug yeah motion. the chug the chug yeah. motion. I was going. <laughs> that, well, that's it, the only way she gets through it is the drinking. So. Yeah. Well, I was I was saying that, and she was over there, and she was giving me the chug motion, right? And and mentally, I was going, I was thinking, okay, she's thirsty. Yeah, she's oh, drinking like, game. Like you backhand someone like Batman. Yeah, yeah that's true. Yeah, Biff. Anytime you hear the tug, you backhand someone. That's how like I got Batman. my name. I got my name. I'm a sound effect in the old Batman TV show. Biff. <laughs> Biff. Pow. So yeah, your name should have been Pow. Oh yeah. I don't know what the last name would have been. All right, pal. go ahead. Stevie has a letter. Okay, Stevie has a letter. Hi, Biff and Noss. Once again, thanks for an amazing podcast. I'm in the middle of listening to episode 38. With deadly re-entry, if you right-click on a pod, it will show if it contains a built-in heat shield. Do you remember I had the question um, about 
uh, if uh, about retroactively installing heat shields. Yeah. Yeah, it turns out the three-seater command pod mm -hmm. doesn't have a heat shield anyway. Oh. So there was no heat shield I... to rectify. You have to install it yourself. Oh, okay. It, okay. I was it about shows to say up. How you bring it down, but yeah, no, it shows up. the The funny part about that is, though, do you remember in the last episode I said I had a space station, and I had three guys on it, and I tried to bring them in with the three seater pod, mm -hmm. and it kept blowing up. Yeah. So I sent another three seater pod out, and they EVA'd and got into it, and I brought them in, and now I'm going, and I brought them in without a heat shield. I had just assumed that that it had retroactively installed a heat shield. Yeah. For some reason, even with deadly reentry installed, I, I, actually, I brought them home without a heat shield on the command pod. I probably, honestly, that was probably <laughs> dumb luck more than anything. Wow. But the one-seater, uh, the MK1 pod, has a built-in heat shield. And if you right-click on it, it shows as ablative, and it's like 250. Mm -hmm. uh, is the uh, that's the that's the units and it'll show you as you're burning through the atmosphere uh, it'll show you the number of units start ticking down yeah you know it's it's another commodity that uh, that you use as you come in yeah i remember seeing the uh the uh what's it yeah yeah it was a uh, jiminy um, okay. Whenever I saw the Jiminy uh, pod, like oh, the, oh, okay. the heat yeah. shield on yeah. it and all the little pieces, like yeah. it was just a bunch of little tiny rubber like right. like cones, mm -hmm. sort of, that were all just stacked in, into each other. But yeah, if you'll go, uh, when you're uh, constructing a ship in the VAB, there are multiple sized heat shields. Uh, if, if you have deadly reentry installed, uh, there are multiple sizes. Okay, everyone take a drink. <laughs> um, there are multiple size heat shields that you can install yeah i did not i did not know that you put like five or six of them on there yeah really yeah i want oh that's a that's a question i wonder if they're stackable yeah there's one that is so big that that it literally it, it is it's bigger than the base of the uh, the three-seater command pod hmm. i was thinking wow that, that you know it's probably like the most inefficient thing ever yeah but, but it'd be like well yeah secure. yeah it's it, you know it's like a it's like a saucer for your uh, teacup. Uh, okay, back to the letter from Stevie. Uh, also, oh yeah, this was another thing. Do you remember I mentioned uh, uh, how much I would like to be able to uh, bring up the cheat menu and go to another planet and test out craft? Well, guess what? There's a mod called Hyper Edit that allows you to do that. Uh, back to the letter from Stevie. Also. You can test out your designs on other planets and moons with the mod Hyper Edit. Sorry if hundreds of people emailed this in. Um, a lot of people did email that in, but you happen to be the first letter we're reading yeah, so, that mentions so you it. You got it. Uh, which, by the way, uh, we will provide a link to Hyper Edit. Uh, as to my progress, I've been quite busy with life lately. Matched out the tech tree in 0 0.90 before everything got too busy. Uh, SAT contracts help a lot. Managed to do some rendezvous without maneuver nodes, so I was quite impressed with myself. That's something I have not been able to do, yeah. so mm -hmm. I'm quite impressed with you yourself as well. Unfortunately, the Australian summer holidays are over now, so back to teaching math to teenagers. You know, you know what makes teaching math to teenagers much more palatable? Birthday clowns. Oh, yeah. Get, get in touch with Nas. <laughs> He'll show up and do birthday clowns. Yeah, if you have any, like, he'll do balloon animals. If you have any construction sites nearby, what uh, you what you can do is you can go like, okay, one balloon animal and another balloon animal. So how many balloon animals do you have? Two. See, I taught you some math. A, a wasted career choice. That's what yeah. you. Have. <laughs> <laughs> I would just, I'm, I, I am now imagining you with like giant clown shoes and a big red can, nose. I have like size thirteen flat foot feet. I already have clown shoes. <laughs> I'm from, you just, to me, I've got like this killer clowns from outer space image in my head. Oh, okay, okay. Uh, let's see. Uh, he's teaching math to teenagers. Uh, I'm trying to think of ways of using KSP to help teach, mostly to have an excuse to play at work. Oh, that's a good idea. Homer to your mobile. Stevie, P.S. Like many others, I listen to the podcast while driving. And although it's never led to an accident, I was once hit from behind while stationary and had to pause the show while sorting it out. PPS. 
Thanks for the recommendation of the Space Rocket History podcast. Yeah, uh, two podcasts that I recommend. Space Rocket History is a very good one. And for the Star Trek, uh, the the Trek fiend and all of us, Mission Log podcast. Yeah. I love, the, you know, I, I, I it's not funny that he was hit from behind. You know, I'm glad that he's okay. But it is funny that it's like, bam, hang on, I got to pause the show. Yeah. <laughs> you bring that up in court. <laughs> I would like, uh, you know, but, like restitution for damages. Okay, I mean, did you get injured? No, but I had to stop a podcast yeah. I was enjoying. It was a really good part, too. Yeah. One of the few. <laughs> okay, anyway, uh, that letter was from Stevie. Uh, thank you very much. From Romeo. Cheating yourself to other planets. Hyperedit exists, and yep. we'll provide a link to that. On the subject of rocket cars, they cannot go very far. You will get about to the hill to the west of the KSC. If you're very lucky, you'll make it up the hill. Then, no matter how lucky you are, you will explode when you hit the ground past that hill. The ground is just way too bumpy to go at such high speeds. I was going at a very slow speed. I was kind of cruising along. Mm -hmm. But I definitely know what he means because there was no point. Like, there was not a point I saw where I could go fast for any amount of time. I had... I wondered about that when you first mentioned rocket cars. I just... I thought I just for some reason I, I I just thought that that might be difficult yeah to go very far. Uh, let's see next letter F I T O Ryan, you're fired and possible implementations. Depending on where they set the you're fired mark would determine how long you circle the drain. We'll have to wait and see just how bad you have to do and for how long before it activates. Once they added funds and reputation, there was a fail condition to the game. It just requires you to recognize it yourself. Having the game tell you may reduce the time you circle the drain. I also had an idea that makes it less of a game over and more of a choice. They, they being squad, could have this dialogue box pop up and give you the option to end the game, start over, or get an infusion of funds and reputation. Maybe tie that last one to successfully going through some of the tutorials. What do you think of that last one? One thing I've wanted since contracts were added. Story through linked contracts. Quest chains, in fact. So I've that's something I've talked about, too. Yeah. Like if you get a ship stranded in orbit, then have the rescue contract come up. Tanas, I think a lot of your problems with career are just a lack of experience. Work on your efficiency. From the description of where you are in career and the tech you have available and the number of parts and weight you can build up to, you should be capable of getting to a whole lot of places and completing the very lucrative exploration missions. I wish I could show you the rockets I used to get to Duna and Eve when I was where you are in career. It vexes me when someone is having a problem with something and I don't have the ability to directly help. I, too, dislike part testing, but there is a way around it. You should be able to, at this point, to put a probe with transmitter, solar, and a thermometer, a thermometer, just because, <laughs> uh, into lower orbit around Kerbin, Mun, Minmus, Duna, and Eve. Once you've done that, I'm assuming he means one for each, right? Yes? Yeah. Okay. Uh, once you've done that, leave them there. Then contracts will pop up, return or transmit science from space around X, accept it, and then just switch to your craft and run the thermometer and transmit. Even if you get no science points for it, it will complete the contract for very easy money. The ability to put a single Kerbal in a pod with power and a transmitter or probe with power and a transmitter and science instrument in orbit of Kerbin and more so in orbit of the Mun and Minmus should mark the end of your money problems. What do you think of that? Um, I I had heard that plan of putting the putting the probe or whatever in orbit, mm -hmm. and I haven't done it yet. I um, I've been working on the Mun contract, but I think that's what I'm going to do next since I've gotten so many suggestions on it. Right. Um, the thing is, that a lot of them say thermometer, and and I don't know if it's different orbiting. Uh, Kerbin, but whenever I've been orbiting the uh, the Mun, it doesn't let me do anything with. Yeah, the it says you can't you can't take a reading. Yeah, I can't take a reading in space. I'm pretty sure. Yeah, like I don't I don't know if it's just in space or if it's around the an atmospheric body or something. That's interesting. Yeah. So, um, I mean, I could easily just do it with a with a Kerbal and just keep doing crew reports. Mm -hmm. So, I think I may just do that. 
Well, don't don't install the life support mod then. Yeah, Cause, yeah. Because then you can't leave them out there indefinitely. Yeah, or the boredom mod. <laughs> the boredom mod. Uh, to Biff, Eve. Oh, and the other thing we should say as far as as far as NOS goes, you don't have access to this game. What five five days out of the week? Yeah, about five six days of the week. So. so you're you're having some real trouble right now just being able to put some time in. Do you know somebody? Uh, when I was on Steam the other day, somebody in a chat window came up and suggested we should start a fundraiser getting us a laptop. <laughs> <laughs> I I would. I would endlessly appreciate it, but I'm by no means going to start asking people to give yeah. money. for oh, that, I know, for that I know. it was it was a joke, but I just yeah. laughed. I thought, yeah. you know, of all the worthy causes out there, <laughs> right? It's like get NASA a laptop. Yeah. You know, the problem is, is that if 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 they actually happened, they would demand access to like your like your um, your camera and microphone uh -huh. at all times. Yeah, to make sure I was playing. Why yeah. isn't he playing? Yeah, he's working right now. He's putting putting together balloon animals. You'd be asleep, and they'd like they'd like log in, and they'd see you, and then they'd activate the speakers and go, "Wake up! Yeah, play Kerbal." <laughs> that, or if you were doing something else on the laptop that they disapproved of. Yeah, yeah. That's all I'm gonna say. <laughs> uh, to Biff, Eve, the key to land was something. Uh, the key is to land with something that can get all by that could all by itself get into orbit. Oh, that's it. Yeah. That that's easy. Why didn't I think of that? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, I've been wrestling with that right there. Uh, the key is to land with something that could all by itself get into orbit. Kerbin works as a rough testing ground. Your lander has to be at least capable of getting into orbit from a launch on Kerbin. Overbuilding it just a smidge, and you've got your Eve ascent stage. Then it's a matter of transporting that to Eve and getting it down without using any of the ascent fuel and all that jazz. As for testing in other environments, a lot I've heard of but not used, Hyper Edit allows you to cheat things into existence in orbit or I think onto the surface of any body in the system you want. Again, we will provide a link to Hyper Edit. I play career pretty much exclusively and entirely stock. I use Sandbox to test ideas out before using them in career. I've been playing since, I think, 1.3, oh wow, 1.3 maybe, 1.2 or 1.11, I'm sorry, point, point 0.12. Yeah. What did I say, 1.2? Yeah, I was like, wow. hey, way ahead of us. Squad is like, wait a minute, we didn't release that yet. Uh, yeah, so uh, point 0.13 maybe, point 0.12 or point 0.11, not sure. There wasn't a map mode or any other bodies than Kerbin and the Mun, and the Mun had just been added. Not even the Sun existed as a body. I am proud to say I managed to get into orbit around the Mun back then. In career now, without the upgrade to the tracking station to get patched conics, which show you when you will get an intercept with the SOI, I can almost relive that feeling of blindly flying to where I hope the Mun will be. The new player experience, 95% of the problems my parents have with their computers can be solved within 10 seconds of me right-clicking. Right-click is not as common a skill as those of us who are computer savvy would like to think. Uh, right-click also is not very common in games as a method of interacting with menus. We've talked about that, yeah. the, number, the number of times you accidentally right-click on something and go, oh my God, there's a whole menu here mm -hmm. that I was totally unaware of. Watching new people play the game. They never even think to right-click on anything. Game mechanics hidden behind right-click might as well not exist as far as new players are concerned. I don't know how to correct this. Part of me wants a PSA to play on every nightly news commercial break all over the country all the time to tell people to remember to try right-clicking whenever they have a problem. But I think that's beyond squad scope. Keep up the good fun. FIT Orion. Can you imagine a commercial like that every yeah. night? When right in doubt, click. Right click. Right click. Oh, it would just, you know what it would be? It would be 30 seconds. Right click. Right click. <laughs> right click. <laughs> All hail right click. Yeah. From Tapor, T A P O R. Biff and Nas, I haven't spent much time in KSB making sandwich or otherwise of late because I'm trying to finish this darned accounting diploma. Well, you got to focus on your priorities. Yeah. So you got to make Kerbal. 
I was going to say a sandwich. That said, <laughs> after your Kettlewell experience, I decided to install Near and Dre. Deadly reentry. Deadly reentry. You can't forget about Dre. Yeah. With rockets, I or Doctor Dre, I found it easier to get to space compared to stock, and haven't killed Jeb on a reentry yet. Space planes, on the other hand, flip flop smash. If 1.0 uh, gets this extreme, the new players might have trouble, but I think it will likely get an option at the new game menu, like destructible buildings. I'm not investing too much time in 0 0.90, as I really want to try doing one career until time runs out. I read someplace the KSP save game will go around 230 years. I want to find the end of that rainbow. Scalzi is great and all, but maybe you should check out some Halderman. Oh, yeah. Oh, you, remember, Halderman. you remember I was talking about, you remember I said Old Man's War? Yeah. John Scalzi? Yeah. Yeah. He said, he, no, no doubt you've read The Forever War. I ha You know, I, it's, it's funny that he mentions that. Um, Old Man's War is kind of an updated Starship Troopers, The Forever War. Yeah. I've already read Starship Troopers, mm -hmm. and after reading Old Man's War, um, I was reading some of the reviews and whatever, and somebody mentioned The Forever War by Joe Haldeman. So I have that now. I just haven't had a chance to read it. Our library had a um, um, sale the other night. Yeah. Uh, they once a year they they sell their overstock and it's like I think it's fifty cents for paperbacks and a dollar for hardbacks. Yeah, I see that tower over there. Yeah, so I mean it was like I went to the science fiction section and it was you know it was, it was like I just like extended my arm out and I had a box and I was just going yeah <laughs> get a blue barrel out. yeah I was just like everything I could see so but yes I have lots of I have plenty of Haldeman now uh, and I'm going I'm going to be reading the forever war soon all right anyway I'm jutting out of stuff I need to make the TV work so I'll chat more later PS props to the official KSP forum I joined up this week and everyone is super friendly I haven't seen a forum like that since like 2002 if ever keep up the good and long podcast tapor so is he saying that uh, that that uh internet etiquette has gone down since 2002 no i think it's been going down since 1992 yeah <laughs> wow yeah uh okay let's move on uh next letter uh this comes from fail sauce hi guys i'm a newish listener and i'm loving the show listening to you talk about squads planned game over edition i had a couple of thoughts without adding some kind of game over mechanic Players can accidentally work themselves into situations where they simply can't progress. This Kerbal Purgatory is no fun and very unfriendly for new players. At the same time, a game over after 20 plus hours of gameplay would be pretty br brutal. Everyone take a drink. Thus my idea. The game could continue even after you got fired. When you failed, your little Kerbal would pack his things and a new boss would come in who you would then control. Your current funds and reputation would reset, contracts canceled, but your scientific and facility progress would remain. The measure of success would be how few managers you'd go through along the way. I'm picturing a wall of managers in one of the facilities where each Kerbal executive would have their portrait up with how long they held the position, successful contracts, and how many Kerbals died under their watch. I'm not sure if this is something Squad is con considering, but it seems like the best solution in my mind. Thanks, and keep up the good work on the show. Fail Sauce. That's an interesting idea. That's kind of a, that's like your, your fired light. Yeah, so I, this is like, it's kind of like that. I was just playing a board game yesterday. It's mm -hmm. called Merchants and Marauders, okay. and you you were pirates in like uh in like the Caribbean and stuff. And you're sailing around, and you can, I mean, it's called Merchants and Marauders. You could either go and trade goods, mm -hmm. or you could be a pirate and you could like shoot down other players and steal their stuff and things <laughs> like that. Well, you had a captain, and at any time, if your captain died, you lost everything that was in your boat. Like you lost all your cargo, you lost all your gold or whatever. Mm -hmm. And if you didn't have um, any gold in your stash, like you wouldn't lose gold from there if you had any gold like in your private stash. Mm -hmm. Well, if you didn't have any there and if you didn't have anything like period, um, you would start with a new captain and 10 gold. If you already had some, like some gold in your stash, you would start with a new captain, but not with the gold. 
but okay. it kept you from being completely stuck. Like if you already had a couple points that you could win the game with, it just gave you a new captain and said, you're already doing okay, just keep mm -hmm. trying. Right. If you did pretty poorly and you didn't have any gold stashed, you lost everything and it said, okay, start over, here's 10 gold, try to get something going again. So it's kind of like that. And it actually worked pretty well in the game. Like somebody had somebody had their ship sunk and they lost their, you know, they didn't have anything set up yet. Mm -hmm. So they started, they got basically a clean slate to start over with. But they, and another player had actually been doing pretty well, but they just ran into some, you know, ran into trouble with the law, got their ship sunk. Right. And they started over again, but didn't start with that starting bonus. Question. Um let's say that the player that that lost everything yeah when they restart do they restart against the other players at their experience level yes in other yes. words you're you're starting over but you're starting against players that have a lot more experience and resources and yes progress. like they still okay. they still have all their current progress okay. it didn't seem too out of whack though because basically what you had to do is you had to just avoid those players if they were coming after you mm -hmm. and those players wouldn't come after you because they didn't have a lot to gain because you ah. didn't have anything on your boat because so, you were because you were so small small fry yeah okay. now anyone who had a totally loaded up boat and had bounties on their heads and gold and crew and stuff like you'd go after those guys because there's actually a reason to okay yeah okay the reason i asked was i thought you know, restarting against yeah, really so, yeah, powerful. Yeah, in that situation, yeah, that would have that would have stunk. Yeah, yeah. but uh, but yeah, if, if if there's no incentive to go after you, mm -hmm. so and I and I guess I should make uh, at this point. I mean, we don't really know what the game over mechanic is yeah. going to look like. So I'm I'm interested in seeing it to see what exactly it does and what exactly it means. Does it just means like, hey, uh, you pretty much can't keep going. Yeah. So. And I said game over. It's the year fired mechanic. Mm -hmm. I mean, we don't know how squad's going to implement it. For all we know, that's what they're going to do already. They yeah. may already have that in place. Uh, so I mean, we'll have to see. Um, it's interesting. We're getting some. Um, we're getting some interesting opinions about it. Um, but you know, we'll see. Uh, let's see. Next letter uh, is for you. You've got the next letter. Okay, from Tutatis. Hi, Biff and Nos. First, I wanted to say that the podcast is great. I look forward Yay. to it coming out each week, and I really appreciate the work you both put into it. Well, thank you. So, Nos, I wanted to tell you that I also came up with something very similar to the Roly. <laughs> As such, it is clearly a design that offers unique advantages, similar to how Chameleon and the Cuttlefish both independently evolved camouflage to meet the needs of their environments. That's. I'm not going to say that was my thinking when I made the Roly, but I would like to say that's the end result. I, one thing that just tickles me to death, you are the only Kerbal player that I've ever come across yeah. that spends more time on the ground <laughs> than actually off of it. You know, uh, we had that interview with Max Maps a long yeah. time ago, yeah. and um, he was talking about how some guy made a mod for trains, and mm -hmm. they're like, well, we don't really, we're not really going to use that. And I was yeah. like, you know, it would be nice if I could build trains. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'm building trains, but yeah. they're in space. Space trains. Kerbal space program. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it just, it it's, th that's, you know, I've always, you know, I've talked about sandbox and things. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the nice thing about this game is everybody's going to play it differently. Yeah. And, I mean, you have literally made a very unique Kerbal. <laughs> Because, I mean, you came into it, and it was like, I'm going to make things that roll. I'm going to make things that float and bounce. And, yeah. you know, it's like, <laughs> and I'm going, um, why? <laughs> I'm going, okay. Okay, back to the letter. Meanwhile, I, I'm over here on the MUN. When I built my first MUN rovers, I had an annoying habit of flipping them within minutes of landing. I first tried to build rovers that could turn themselves upright when landing legs attached to their back, but this was extremely fiddly and mostly didn't work at all. In frustration, I took a probe core, added half a dozen batteries so that it formed a long cylinder, flopped it on its side, then covered every available space with wheels. <laughs> to my surprise, this was incredibly fun to drive. I, I know. To drive as soon as you turn it, it rolls sideways and I start to giggle uncontrollably. I found nothing was more fun for bombing around the shores of Kerbin or ramping of craters on the MUN. The only thing that stops it is when I ran out of power or too many tires got destroyed by my reckless driving. This also caused one of my friends to remark, I thought KSP was supposed to be serious. Oh, come on. They're green. <laughs> They're green. How serious can I be? I got to say, like, you you really need to, if if you haven't yet, build some sort of rolly like thing uh -huh. and, and land it on the MUN. 
because driving that thing around and doing flips and stuff when you ramp hills is a, it's so much fun. Do you know what? Do you know what the mental image I got was? What? You, in the Dark Knight and the Dark Knight Rises, you know the Bat Cycle. Yeah, has the rotating wheels mm -hmm. on it. And when I was when he was talking about that, that's what I was thinking. Yeah. Because you know how that he can do like he can corner on a dime because the wheels spin. Mm -hmm. I don't mean spin. They like, like rotate. Yeah, they rotate. Yeah. So anyway, he was talking about that, and I was thinking, wow, he made the bat cycle on the mun. <laughs> Eventually, I shelled my solar polar roller rover. It only took one trip the to the what? poles, but I feel that justifies the same. Solar polar roller rover. Rover. Say, I got it right say, the first time. Say it. Say it again. Solar polar roller rover. Say it again. Solar polar roller rover. For the sake of say the, it backwards. For the <laughs> rover roller polar solar. <laughs> I'm, for the sake of the audience, we're going to continue the letter. <laughs> but after hearing about your exploits, I came back to it. I realized that by adding a crew capsule and some nuclear radiothermal generators, it could run forever. Further refinements added air intakes, which, due to their weird interaction with water in the game, allowed this insane creation to travel on water like some sort of monstrous nightmare water wheel. I'm quite proud of this, as this is the most stupid thing I've ever created. And Biff, after hearing about your troubles with Eve, and as you seem to be unable to break up with her, I thought I might give some relationship advice. Essentially, Eve is hard, and I think you're trying to run before you walk. The rocket you've described, with a capacity of up to four crew and a hitchhiker unit, sounds huge. I try to land just a probe core and return it at first. Then a probe core and some science, and finally a manned, or should I say Kerbal, ship with capacity for one crew member. This should let you build experience in a much more organic way. Now, you know the reason that I, I, I have a hitchhiker container, but there's nobody in it. Yeah. I have a hitchhiker container on the bottom. So you don't have to use the ladders. Yeah, because I have had, uh, <laughs> anyone who's listened to this podcast knows I have the worst luck with ladders. <laughs> when I did, uh, I told you I went to Kerbin, Mun, Min, Miss, and Back mm -hmm. last week. Yeah. I What I did was I landed at the top at a high point on Min, Miss. And then I walked all the way down to Minmus has it has these areas that look like um, uh, like solidified lava. They're very uh, they're very smooth uh -huh. and they're and they're kind of darker. Yeah. And what I did was I walked down out of the mountains down to one of those things, and it was a long walk. And so I used the EVA jetpack a lot of the way down there, and I finally got to a point where I had to stop using it because I had used more than half of the EVA fuel. Yeah. And I knew that getting back was going to be a long process. By the time I got back to the ship, I was completely out of EVA fuel. And get uh, take a drink. We got more tag flapping. <laughs> um, by the time I got back to the um, to the lander, and I started climbing up the ladder he would get to the top and then he would fall backwards and this is on minmus for god's sake yeah and i could not uh if i jumped straight up he would go straight up and straight down so what i ended up having to do was i would have to walk i had to keep experimenting walking far enough back mm -hmm. and then i would run and jump and i finally got to where my arc was just right where i landed on top of it and was able to get into the uh, into the command pod. <laughs> but uh, but even on Minmus, I'm having trouble getting up and over the lip yeah. on, on ladders. Wow. But the reason that I have a hitchhiker container is so that I can do, I can leave, I can transfer, I can do a crew current transfer from the pod to the hitchhiker container, step out of it, step onto the surface, then get back into the hitchhiker thing, and then transfer from the hitchhiker container back into the pod. <laughs> because ladders do not like me for yeah. some reason. Yeah. So that's why. I mean, it, it is a fairly large ship, but it's only got one guy in it. And he's and the only reason the hitchhiker thing is there is otherwise I would be having trouble with ladders. So <laughs> anyway. Okay, he has two more tips. Try to consider the atmospheric specific impulse of the engine you're using and the altitude you launch from. Most engines choke on the thick atmosphere of Eve, but aero spikes are designed to work well at all pressure, so will help you get more bang for your buck. And rather than fight through the atmosphere, try to land as high as possible so you don't have as far to go back through the atmosphere. Some even build rockets that are also rovers and drive to a high altitude before launching, gain of all of that altitude for free in terms of fuel. 
Also in a situation with as high delta V requirements as launching from EVE, minimizing the mass of your final stage is paramount. Every extra kilo increases the size of the rocket and brings in new problems with error braking, landing, and stability. So take back to orbit only what you absolutely need. Again, the rocket you described has a capacity for four crew, and if you weren't planning on taking all four Kerbals to the surface, then there are other options that are lighter. If you're worried about the welfare of your Kerbals during their stay on the planet, you can always bring a separate living quarters along and leave it on the surface for the next mission to use. If you really want performance, scrap the control cabin entirely and just have Jeb ride in an external control seat like the true rad dude that he is. <laughs> doing this and starting from That's a high altitude. That's not what he wrote. I know, but keeping it friendly. Uh, doing this and starting from a high altitude can get you into orbit with a starting mass of around 20 tons, a bit more than half the mass of a single orange tank. Finally, I'd like to comment on the altitude records at the start of the career game. While I agree that the balance of difficulty is definitely off in the early career mode, I disagree with the idea that failing to get every altitude contract is punishing players by not explaining its rules properly. Rather, I think it should be seen as encouraging new players to get just a little bit further than last time. Seasoned players should, however, be provided with enough support from other places that they don't need the funds from this source, and that is not currently the case. Sure, you can try to get each altitude record, but I think trying to do so is like trying to get a perfect run in other games, and that always involves the, uh, gaming the system somewhat. Perhaps this is one area where having such an active community around the game detracts from it. Anyway, I've rambled on more than long enough. Thanks again for all the hard work. Don't fly angry. Toodalus. Don't fly angry. Yeah. That's interesting. <laughs> uh, let's see. Okay, next letter. This is from Matt from Switzerland. Hi, Biff and Noss. Thank you very much for your fun podcast. I just listened to episode 38 of your podcast, and towards the end of the first hour, you mentioned the wish for a test bed to check out those newly designed landers and rovers on different destinations without flying each new design there and find out about that missing fuel line upon arrival. I was working on an EVE lander and return concept and was wishing for two possibilities. A. Either modify Kerbin's gravity and atmosphere into the same as EVE, or B. Have a way to teleport my lander on the surface of my planet of interest. Searching for A in the Kerbal forums led to the recommendation from someone to try B and using the mod HyperEdit for that. I downloaded and tested the mod a number of times and I can confirm that it does what it should quite nicely. Actually, some hours ago, I managed to reach EVE orbit with my lander, and there are multiple exclamation points. And um, there is an emoticon. It is a smiley face with a wink, and there's two smiley faces. Well, there's there's two smiles, although that may just be a double chin. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe a double chin. Maybe he's a happy, heavy eater. <laughs> uh, how to do it? Install the mod, start KSP, design a lander with enough landing legs to hold its weight and RCS to rotate your ship. Click on launch. Use key combo Alt H. It brings up the main menu of Hyper Edit. In the Hyper Edit main menu, click on Orbit Editor. Click Select Orbit to Edit. Choose Active Vessel. In Altitude, type around 5000 and click Select Body. Select Eve. Don't click on Set Yet. In the Hyper Edit main menu, click on Ship Lander. Set Latitude and Longitude to values that correspond to land mass and set Altitude to 200. Now comes the part where you have to be quick. In the Orbit Editor window, Click on Set, and once your ship has been moved to EVE, click in the lander window on the radio button labeled Landing to hold your ship in midair and letting it gently fall to the surface with about 1.7 meters per second. Hopefully, your RCS is strong enough to turn the ship in time. I found out that the lander legs cannot hold the weight of my lander, and I used the aircraft retractable gear since then. It is amazingly durable. Though somehow I think that's not how it was intended. Choose your landing site on EVE carefully. Try to select a very high landing spot to keep the atmosphere that you have to cross on the way up as short as possible. Cheers, Matt from Switzerland. That's cool. Now, not only do we know about the mod, the mod but we know how to use it. Yeah. From Eric S., Biff and Noss. 
I'm so glad I found your podcast. The hard work you put into the production of each episode is very much appreciated. Certainly looking forward to many more episodes. Thank you. In your last podcast, you mentioned having a problem testing your designs. I believe you're specifically referencing testing an Evelander with Ascent Craft Designs. Have you heard of the Hyper Edit mod? I think yes. we have. <laughs> it might be it's exactly what you're looking for. The mod will allow you to teleport your craft anywhere in the system. This will allow you to quickly build and test prototype designs without the overhead of launch, to, launch vehicles, transfer stages, and associated gameplay time doing interplanetary transfers. Just assemble your prototype in the VAB uh, or space plane hangar, launch, and use the mod to whisk you away to all sorts of testing fun. I guess some could say it takes a bit of the fun out of the testing process. I say when confronted with the cruel, cruel, evil mistress that is Eve, any helping hand in the design process is fair game. As with any mod installation, it is always a good idea to back up those saves and game directories before you go messing around. Maybe even go so far as to keep a second copy of KSP solely for design testing, thus keeping your real save file free from any unneeded tinkering. And we'll provide a link to HyperEdit as... As we've said as repeatedly. We've said yeah. Keep up the wonderful broadcasting. Love Amy, Amy's A Kerbal Life segment. All my best to everyone involved in making this great podcast. Your friend, Eric S. Yeah, and I should mention uh, we're very close to the end of our letters. Uh, so we're also very close to A Kerbal Life. Yeah. Um, it sounds like with the uh, hyper edit, it sounds like what you do, um, if I understood correctly, uh, it's, it sounds like you literally set the location you want to go to. Mm -hmm. And it pops I mean, you over there. Well, it's, I mean, it sounds like it's really specific, like yeah. latitude and longitude. Mm. I don't know. We'll find out. Okay. Uh, North Star. Uh, we had talked about this uh, earlier. Uh, he had sent in a fairly lengthy letter, and I needed some time to work on it to, to get it down a little bit in length. Well, here it is. This is the letter we were talking about last week um, from North Star. Oh, and by the way, this was written um, before he watched me play. I have <laughs> a feeling the next letter I get from him is going to be, you know, Dear Biff, you idiot. So anyway, okay, from North Star. I wanted to take a moment to highlight some really cool stuff I've been doing related to KSP. Lately, I not only got my mass driver mod up and working for KSP 0 0.90, I also have been working with the excellent modder coder from the KSP forums, Freethinker, to help deliver new levels of integration between the mods, KSP, Interstellar, and Real Fuels, and even more awesomely, have worked with Freethinker to expand the KSP Interstellar mod to allow players to create their own propulsive fluid accumulators. If you don't know what that is, I'll give you the 30 second summary. A propulsive fluid accumulator is a special type of satellite that operates right at the edge of an atmosphere in the lower part of the atmosphere, in the thermosphere, and serves to collect fuel mass from the edge of the atmosphere. Well, not technically fuel, but gases like carbon dioxide and nitrogen that can be utilized as rocket propellants when combined with a thermal rocket engine. This is a real concept, not science fiction. If you or any of your listeners want to try out this awesome feature, you need to install the KSP Interstellar 0.90 port and the KSP Interstellar expansion config which contains the features that enable propulsive fueled accumulators. And the hope is to eventually get this added to the main 0.90 port and then into the base version of the mod maintained by Fractal UK when it's updated for 0.90 or 1.0, but it's not 100% finished yet as some small balancing bug fixing tweaks are still being applied in regular updates before in getting it integrated into the main 0.90 port. I help make propulsive fluid accumulators and mass drivers a reality in KSP with mods because I would very much like to see a more widespread awareness of these and other technological possibilities for cheaper space travel and to see other players and myself recreate these systems on a more routine basis in KSP. Regards, North Star. I told you, he knows his stuff. Yeah. Okay, so here's some of the tweets we got this week on at KerbalCast. At Tanak said, first Duna landing. Now let's see if I can get it back to Kerbin. At Republic of Stars, don't know if you've heard of this. Carbonite, MKS, etc. becoming stock in 1.0. Seems like big news. 
At this is Alex Boyd, remap the Steam overlay to Control Tab to avoid throttling up accidentally. That would solve that problem. Yeah. Um, Mitten Poe, the moment you feel that you're in space, it's beautiful. Carmescence, lol, I just realized that Kerbals have managed to land on more celestial bodies than mankind. That's depressing. At Pluto moved on. Nos, as a tabletop game designer, how would you make a KSP game? Board game, cards, pen and paper RPG? I'll answer that one in a second. Okay. At Jeb's Junkyard, I found an awesome game on Steam called Moonbase Alpha. It's free, by the way. Yeah. At Don't Panic Rob, you could get fired in the original SimCity, but you really had to mess things up. At Top Boom 1, with Deadly Reentry installed, you should find heat shields under the structure tab in the VAB. The Mark 1 pod has an integrated one. At Brian81584, maybe KSP should have a way to try recovering or dig deeper by taking out a loan. Okay, you can answer the question. Uh, for Pluto Moved On, uh, if I was to do it, I wouldn't do a pen and paper RPG because um, it would you'd spend most of the time just like drafting things for uh, you know schematics. Okay. If I did, if I made a Kerbal game, it would either be a very simplistic card game mm -hmm. where you would have different cards that were different parts, and you'd lay them down on the on the board to make different parts of your ship for whatever mission you're trying to complete. Mm -hmm. If it was a board game, then it's kind of hard with... You have to kind of let go of some certain things. You can't make it scientifically accurate. Right. Like, there are some things you just have to let go of. Uh, all, and many games that were made for um, space races, like there was a game called 1969, mm -hmm. and it was interesting, but it played the exact same way every time you played it. Okay. So, um, now, I don't know all the specifics. I haven't really tried making a Kerbal card game. I I could uh, I don't know I'll put that in my uh, in my thought process and I'll see if I come up with anything. Are you saying the reason you would drop a lot of things is because it would basically siphon out the fun factor? Yeah, because you get so um, locked into doing details. Like you'll you'll see a lot of times where you'll have um, games you're making, and you have to actually um, be okay with leaving out details or being slightly inaccurate for the sake of the game still being good, playable, and interesting. Mm -hmm. So it's like a lot of people are like, oh, this isn't the full scientific process and operation. You're not actually having to, yeah, you know, right. do anesthesia on the guy you're pulling those things out of. <laughs> it's like, well, I'm pretty sure if we added that, it wouldn't be the fun game, yeah, kids game. Right. It would be. So yeah, you have to you have to just basically find what is the fun. Mm -hmm. Like, what is where is the fun in KSP, and how can I bring that out in a game? So anytime you try to translate anything into a game, you have to really think about that. See, I would. Uh, what would be hard for me uh, translating this into a board game? The fun for me is flying the ships. Yeah, you know, and you're not going to get that in a board game. Mm -hmm. Now, if if you enjoy playing KSP, like with the career building aspects of it, yeah. I could see that going. There's a lot a of potential game. there for the yeah. career mode. Yeah. But I mean, what I enjoy, I mean, I enjoy literally the building and the flying and the mm -hmm. landing and all that other stuff. See, so. the way you'd have to approach it is, um, like, there's a there's a game, it's like, it's kind of, it's like literally fantasy football. It's called Blood Bowl. Mm -hmm. And there's the Blood Bowl miniatures game where you're a bunch of fantasy, like, dwarves and elves playing football and, like, mm -hmm. you know, like, throwing each other around and tackling each other and, like, you know, setting each other on fire, doing all sorts of crazy fantasy right, stuff. Right, right. Well, they you want, shall not intercept. Yeah, they want to make it like a, a card game. It doesn't really translate all that well. So um, you have to. What they did is they made Blood Bowl team manager, and you're the mm -hmm. team manager. So what would probably be better if you made a Kerbal card game or a board game? You'd probably be like a facility manager of the Kerbal space program, mm -hmm. and so you would try to prep things for launch or build ships and. Um, you know, see how see how it turned out. Yeah, but yeah, it's it's a fun thought. Yeah, you know, like I I uh, made a I made like a small um, Minecraft game one time, like a little Minecraft board. Really? Game one time. Yeah, it was just, like somebody asked, like, do you think you could do that? And I was like, oh yeah. So I I drafted uh, and we play tested like a small Minecraft game, and then I made a card game too that I would I just had in the uh, pre planning phase, but I never actually made a prototype. How? Okay, I'm so baffled. How could you... Because, I mean, Minecraft to me is building. Yeah, so um, you basically take a task in Minecraft and you do that. We're getting way off, but I'll, <laughs> I'll just make it quick. There's a game that people play in multiplayer Minecraft called Spleef. Uh -huh. And the game is like way up in the air. They build a platform of uh, dirt. Uh -huh. 
and everyone runs around with shovels and you try to dig out the dirt from under the other people to like get them to fall through and you know fall off the platform mm -hmm. so i made that into a into a board game okay yeah and then for the game itself like it was i was on a drive back from a convention just sitting in the car and somebody had, like a friend kept asking me all right make an idea for a game about this and you would just point out something and i'd be like oh you'd probably do this and this and this so i made a like a sort of minecraft card game but i never actually prototyped it or play tested it so there's no telling how it'd be it seems to me like um a game like minecraft a game like um, kerbal space program i i don't know that you could fully represent them oh never yeah no. if you did it would be way too long like they made a world of warcraft board game mm -hmm. and it was hours and hours long and it just it was awful oh, wow <laughs> it, i mean it had some redeeming points to it but for the most part you spent hours and hours just like not doing much and i mean i guess they encapsulated some like you know farming boars and you yeah. know <laughs> in, in world of warcraft so you know it it makes me think of um you know how people always joke about kerbal lego yeah i mean to me that would be as close to the actual game mm-hmm because you could take all those pieces and you could build your little rocket ships and then you could hold them up in the air and run around the rim and go yeah yeah so <laughs> ah! well speaking of ah! uh it's time for a kerbal life uh do you want to do the intro um there's uh the mods mech jeb take a drink mech jeb showed up <laughs> and um <laughs> Yeah, rendezvous was not yeah, fun. They were having all kinds of yeah, trouble with the rendezvous. Never fun. And uh, take a drink and uh, Kerbal Life. Okay, let's do it. History is in the making as the secretive MOD organization stepped in at the KFC to help Mooner One to achieve orbital rendezvous around the bun. Mooner One is now docked with Refueler One. And we now await the separation of Lander One. So Gemini and Bob Kerman can finally set foot on the Mun. One. Mission control to Mooner One. Jeb, we need you to link up with Bob and separate the lander. The administrator really wants both of you down on the Mun today. Uh, copy that, BBC. One question, though. What's that, Jeb? Bob is back in the command pod at the back end of the Mooner One, and I'm in the command pod here with the lander. Both command pods only hold one Kerbal, so... How are we both going to get down? Now, I'm no expert, but I reckon if you go down slow enough, Bob can just hang on to the side and you'll be fine. The side of the ship? Roger that, Jeb. Bob should be there in a moment. I did wonder what the personal EVA was for. Ah, MC, Bob is banged into the window here in the command pod. He's grabbing on for dear life and his face looks like a mixture of panic and terror with a touch of regret and disbelief. Copy that, Jeb. Bob? Yes, MC? I think now's a good time for you to remember my catchphrase. Hold on tight. Hold on tight. You've got to... That's a song, MC, not a catchphrase. Jeb, stand by for go on lander separation. Standing by. Hey, Jeb, I'm not sure about this. Bob, I'm sure they looked at every angle and judged to be perfectly safe. Still. Jeb, you are go for lander separation. Press the blue button now. Blue button pressed. Lander separation. Wow, that was so much easier than docking. Okay, Jeb, take her down nice and slow. Remember, you have a passenger. Throttling retrograde and straightening up. Bob has a look out there. Let's get in here too, Bob. Can you believe we're actually going to do this? We're going to set foot on the mud. Do you want to taste it first to show off? Okay, okay, if you insist. Mission Control, we are on a smooth descent with no more horizontal velocity. We should be touching down on the mud in 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, touchdown! We have landed on the mud, repeat, we have landed on the mud! Alright! Oh yeah! Sweet! Congratulations, Jeb! Congratulations, Bob! Now the moment we've all been waiting for. You are clear to exit the command pod and set foot on the MUN. Copy that, MC. Bob, you can let go now. Uh, MC, Bob will set foot on the MUN in a little while. Okay, here I go. I'm climbing down the ladder and... Uh-oh. Jeb, what's wrong? Is there a problem? Is the MUN dangerous? 
Did we make a big mistake? Are you out of air? No. The ladder's just a little too short. I'm gonna jump the rest of the way and see. Oh, phew. Copy that, Jeb. You're about to make history. Here I go and see. Hold on. Let me get the profound thing the administrator told me to say out of my pocket. Okay. <clears throat> this is one small jump for co- <laughs> Jeb? Are you down? Copy that and see I am on the lunar surface. I can't believe I'm MC for this moment. Jeb, always remember that you were the first Kerbal to set foot on the mun. Um, actually MC, I'm not. What do you mean you're not? I thought you said you were on the surface of the mun. Well, my foot got caught in the bottom ring of the ladder and I got stuck. So I'm upside down with the top of my head touching the surface of the mun. Oh, that counts. You did it, Jeb. You're the first Kerbal head on the mun. I'm still not sure about that either, MC. Oh? And why is that? Because there's a Kerbal face drawn onto the surface of the mun and we didn't put it there. Then, who did? A Kerbal Life was written by Amy Kettlewell with music by Lee Rosebeer. Jebediah Kerman and Kerbal Space Program were created by Squan. The game is available for purchase on Steam or KerbalSpaceProgram.com. Wait a minute. So, Jeb, Jeb got on the mun, and there was already a yeah. Is it like a face there? Is it like it was a drawn face though? Oh, I know what it is. What was that? I know what it is. What? He needs to he needs to look for a blue glow. If it's a smiley face, it's Doctor Manhattan. Oh yeah, there you go. Yeah, that's what it is. I was about to say if he sees a shadow, that means he's got like six months more of funding to acquire. <laughs> <laughs> Kerbal Hog Day. Yeah. <laughs> oh wow! So there's a face on the mun. Where did it come from? We'll have to wait. You know, you know what it may be. Maybe it's a. Maybe it's like a leftover Kerbal from an earlier update yeah. of the game. <laughs> they don't want to talk about it. There's like <laughs> some Kerbal up there with like a long beard. I've been up here <laughs> since update point two two. <laughs> Back in point two two, I remember being on the mun. I have no idea where I'm going with that. <laughs> well, okay. Uh, anyway, uh, thanks to Amy Kettlewell, uh, who uh, provides us with uh, our Kerbal Life. I will be interested to see what the uh, what the resolution of that one is. Yeah, yeah. She's already killed Jeb once. Now we've got a smiley face. <laughs> well, I assume it's a smiley face. Mm -hmm. She just said there's a face on the mun, so I'll be curious to see what it is. Uh, we have some thanks to toss out, and of course, uh, we thanked Amy for a Kerbal Life. Uh, who else do we want to thank? We also want to thank our listeners and regular contributors and everyone who sent us letters or tweets. And I mentioned um, how helpful Kerbal Academy, uh, the subreddit, has been, and Kerbal Space Program. There really are some neat links. So go to those subreddits, Kerbal Space Program, Kerbal Academy. Uh, they've also been kind enough to uh, provide a link to this podcast on their front pages as well. Music for A Kerbal Life was provided by Lee Rosevere. Find him at freemusicarchive.org slash music slash Lee underscore Rosevere. Episode music comes to us from Professor Soap. Look for him on Facebook or at profsoap.com. And a big thank you as always to Ask Alon, who posts episodes of Kerbalcast on YouTube each week. Uh, so that you can read the closed captioning uh, as well. If you would like to get in con I hear dogs barking. I guess you take a shot on that. I don't know. But <laughs> okay, if we have a drinking game for tags. Yeah. What kind of what kind of a what do you do when you hear dogs barking? Yeah, you finish your drink. You, you just You know what it, it is? You take all your clothes off and you go outside and run around. Uh, yeah, do that. But yeah, don't, do that. But don't tell, don't mention us in the court case. Yeah, please don't. Don't blame <laughs> us. If you want to contact us but not our warriors, go to KerbalPodcast at gmail.com. <laughs> you can follow us on Twitter at KerbalCast. <laughs> but not our lawyers. You funny. You funny. Uh, you can also subscribe to us on iTunes. Uh, and thanks to everyone who's been leaving comments. Uh, it always makes my day to see comments. Uh, all episodes of KerbalCast can be found at kerbalpodcast.libsyn.com. And as we've talked about, uh, if you want to see uh, if, you, uh, if you're going to have a heart attack, uh, you can find us on Steam. Uh, I am Biff Aldrin. He is Nostromo. 
Uh, be sure and uh, log in and say hi. Watch our gameplay. Sometimes we'll show yeah. up and watch your gameplay as well. I oh, also want to say a couple of them have left me chat messages like uh -huh. because I always leave leave it online. Yeah, uh, me too. It, um, they'll leave me chat messages, so whenever I log back in, I'll get them. Mm -hmm. And um, whenever I come back from being on the road, I have like seventy plus unread emails <laughs> and like all these like Facebook <laughs> notifications and all these things from all these different uh, social media things. Right. So I'll read them. And I'll instinctively click uh, to close the box without mm -hmm. responding. But everyone who has sent me anything saying like, hey, you know, great job on the podcast or anything like that, I have read them and I do appreciate it. i just sorry. I just, you yeah. know, I didn't get back. I've been trying to get in the habit of, uh, of setting my status to away yeah. uh, anytime I'm actually away. Mm -hmm. But I don't always do it. Sometimes it'll show that I'm there when I'm not. Yeah. So if if you say hi and I don't respond, that means you're you're talking to a to a lonely laptop. Uh -huh. <laughs> and if it ever answers you, run because the robot apocalypse has started. Uh, if you would like to uh, support Kerbalcast and help us cover the cost, uh, you can donate to us on Patreon.com. Uh, just simply go there and search for Kerbalcast. And that does it for this week's episode, KerbalCast, episode 39, Equal Opportunity Kerbal. Our command module pilot, CMP, is... Nostromo. I am your LMP, Lunar Module Pilot, Biff Aldrin. And until next time, happy, happy kerbling. kerbling.